Good morning to all of our listeners. This is the next in our Working From Home conversations. Today, we are delighted to have Karen Anstis join us. Karen is the service manager of the Kita House, and before that was part of the Metropolitan Police for 31 years. Karen is one of the unsung heroes who is working tirelessly to look after survivors of human trafficking, especially during this COVID pandemic where poor Karen hasn't had a day off since March the 6th. Um, Karen, thank you for joining us today. And please could you tell our listeners a little bit about the Kita House and what you do there? Yes, good morning and thank you for asking me to join you both. Um, so throughout my service when dealing with victims, there was always involvement from churches and different faiths throughout the world um, and sisters throughout the world have always worked with these victims. Um, so in 2014, the Catholic Church decided to form the Santa Marta Group, which was an international response to combat human trafficking. Um, from England, it was led by Cardinal Vincent Nichols. And when he came back from Rome, he basically said to his police partners, what would you really like that could help in London? So all the little hands went up, especially mine. And it was like, we'd really like a safe house that sits outside the government system. So the government, they house and care for victims under the national referral mechanism. But at the time, it was very time constrained. So the police really wanted somewhere we could take victims for longer because to gain that trust takes time. You can't do it in 45 days. Um, so that was the idea of the house in the beginning. Also, it's difficult because a lot of victims will sign a contract before they are trafficked and then they end up in another country exploited, enslaved, abused. So to gain entrance to the national referral mechanism, they have to sign a form. I think for them, that is very difficult to understand. We found here when we opened that within six weeks of being with us, women were then willing to sign that form, but it took them six weeks to get the right advice, to gain the confidence to sign it. They couldn't just do it instantly. So we opened as an immediate place of safety. So the police will now go to a cannabis factory, a brothel, somewhere where someone's enslaved, and within an hour, they can bring that woman back to us. So that first step is so important to gain in trust for the police and the victim, but also for the victim to see that there's somewhere nice that they can start to recover, that there are people in our country that they can trust, and it's just a safe space for them. And how many girls have you got at the Heathen House at the moment? Well, we had a baby born on the 29th of February. Wow. And we had two other pregnant women at the time, and we couldn't find any advice really around the safety of those babies and those women that were pregnant around COVID. So we stopped taking referrals on the 9th of March. We shut down to protect those women. So we now have eight women, three babies, and one mad cat living here. And what's the most amount of women that you can have in the house? We can have up to 12 at one time. But as I say, we haven't taken referrals throughout this period until the advice for us gets stronger. And now we've got three babies under 10 weeks. And so can you just, so this morning we've spoken a little bit about victim and survivor um, and the difference with that. But, you know, the common term is to say that they're survivors of human trafficking, but before they come into the NRM or into your house, they're, they're known as a victim. Is that, is that correct? Yes, that's probably a good way of putting it. There's a lot of emphasis on words. Yeah. And and so being in, in that house now with COVID, you've not had a day off for how, is it, how many days is it now? It's actually, I moved in on the 17th of March. So so what's that like? I mean, what 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 are, what how's the how's the emotion in the house and how's everyone feeling? Well, what we've tried to do is we've reformed a Monday to Friday and a weekend to sh to give the women a routine. So from Monday to Friday between 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. we have activities going on and then we eat together at six. And then at the weekends we meet for exercise on a Saturday afternoon. We eat at six and we do pampering evenings. And then on the Sunday weather permitting it's lunch in the garden or a barbecue at two and then we dance or play ball games um, and then we meet at seven every Sunday night 
and that's to plan the week's meals. So Anna, who's the house manager and myself, do all the shopping for all the food for a week, which is about 230 meals, I think. It's three times a day for 11 of us. And we try to go once. So we do all the prescription runs, all the food bank runs, all the necessities and all the food on a Monday so that we can protect the women from going out. Um, would, sorry. You have done that, would you have done that normally, you know, without COVID? Or is this something that you just put in place now? No, what we normally do is we do the shopping for evening meals because it's very important that the women that come and stay with us learn independence because the whole idea of Key to House is to get people back on their feet. So normally they would be going out and doing all of these things themselves to gain independence, to learn about London, to learn where the shops are, how to deal with money and budgeting. But it's just not the right time for that. We need to protect them really from this illness as much as we can and we felt that was the best way we felt by having a routine and putting in place activities we could sometimes divert their mind from their traffic experiences and covid so we do english sewing baking gardening we've had drama therapy and music therapy put on skype online so they can still access that mm. we have an english volunteer still doing english lessons online so we're trying to do loads of things. We obviously play Uno a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do things that we've got young. in our minds <laughs> for short periods of time. And how, to, uh, on average, how long do the girls stay with you for? What's the sort of average term? It's a difficult question. So when we opened in 2015, we decided it would be three months because at that time the government was 45 days. So we thought three months gives us longer but it really has to depend on the needs of the individual woman and every woman is so individual. So we've actually had women that have come for six weeks because they have decided they wanted to go home. So we've made sure that passage home is safe, that there's charities at the other end that can look after them. And we've had some women who, unfortunately their asylum cases have become rather difficult and they've stayed for 14 months. So it's really needs dependent on the individual. So we've had, 122 women from 39 countries aged between 15 and 70. So as you can see, the range is so massive that you do have to treat everybody as their own person and their own needs. And compared to the NRM system, this is, this is amazing, the, the level of care and service and um, independence and, and sort of freedom they get at, at, at Bakita House. Yeah, I think we're very lucky. So the Diocese of Westminster have a funding team that go out to provide funding for us and work very hard to do that, to allow us to do it. Obviously, the government system, the people that work within it are amazing, but there's always going to be money constraints and money constraints will bring time constraints, especially the more people that go into that system. So it's very easy for me to sit here and say everything's wonderful and we're brilliant, but I think everybody trying to help is brilliant. It's just they don't have the money in the government system to do as they probably would like to do. Karen, what's happening to the survivors at the moment who should be coming to places like Bikita House but can't due to COVID? Well, the Salvation Army who hold the government contract and have some subcontractors working for them, they are opening new houses, they are coping with the amount of victims going into the system, so they're doing a brilliant job at the moment. Um, and when it comes to sort of your background and how you got into this and, you know, what, what you've been doing, can you tell us a bit about what you were doing in the Met for 31 years? Well, probably my bosses would say not a lot. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I, feel, I dealt with my first rape in 1984. And I think as a police officer, you go in and... I didn't know what I really wanted to specialise in. I just wanted to be a police officer. So as you go through your probation and your training, you find the areas that you like. And whatever I tried, I ended up back dealing with victims. So I went to the right unit. I went to the flying squad. But I always ended up going back to a victim-led unit. So in 2000, I went to the vice unit. And we became the trafficking team in 2009 because... When we started, we didn't realise that obviously what we referred to as the pimps that we were arresting were actually traffickers because there were no trafficking laws to 2004. So the awareness really wasn't there. And we'd been dealing with this for many years before it was even noted. 
Um, so we became the traffic team in 2009 and I stayed on that until I left in 2014. Wow. That's a long career in, in something that's so sort of devastating in a way. I mean, seeing all that must have, it, it must be really, really yeah. trying. You know, no, I'm one of the luckiest people you'll meet. I've had two jobs and both jobs have been my dream. And not anybody else can say that, I don't think. I've, I've been so lucky in my career. I loved my work and now I'm here and I love Caritas Peter House. The girls there are so happy and you, you, you foster such a wonderful environment. So it's, thank you, Karen. It's very amazing. It's not me. It's my team. They're amazing. And my volunteers are exceptional. I mean, it takes so much to make this work. It couldn't possibly be one person. It is just everybody around us and the women themselves. But it has to have the right staff and the right volunteers to make it work. It's... Do you know people go, we just need to put a roof over your head? I don't think that's true. I think it's what's under the roof that counts. So I think you could have the most fantastic house, but if you haven't got the right people in there looking after, caring for the, the women, men, families, then it's simply not going to work. So it's very difficult to put that together. Karen, what are some of the biggest challenges you're facing during COVID? Very varied. I think... The first thing is the women that we are looking after have come from isolation. They've come from exploitation. This is meant to be their new beginning and we're back in isolation. So to them, this is very difficult mentally um, because their trauma levels have gone up. They understand why we've got to isolate, but to them, isolation is actually a trigger. We all have different triggers in life, obviously. Sometimes we don't know what they are, but for them, isolation is definitely a trigger and we're back in it. So for them, that is very difficult. It's almost like a further punishment, which is why we're trying to do stuff with them all day to, to take their mind off COVID and trafficking, to just focus somewhere else for a few hours every day to try and help that mental health or that trauma level to, to stay as low as we possibly can. Um, things like asylum being on hold. Now, these women are seeking asylum. They want to know where their future is, you know, if, if this country holds a future for them. So obviously, asylum had to go on hold, but for them, sometimes they find that difficult to understand or to cope with. One of our women is on Ramadan. So unfortunately, before she managed to get the clothing that she needed for it, the shops had all shut. She obviously has difficulty, we have difficulty finding the food that she would like. Because she's fasting, she feels that she can't do a lot of the activity, so she's isolated again because of that, and she can't go to the mosque and join her friends. So she's finding it difficult. A lot of the women here come from various faiths, and of course none of their places of worship are open at the moment. We've had a woman that the good news was she became eligible for benefits, and when we phoned up, we were 65,000 in the queue. Mm -hmm. And then we waited on hold for five hours and we were 57,000 in oh the queue. God. So it was a bit like, this is good news, but it's not happening at the moment. So it's, it's really a case of everything that is affecting everybody in the country is affecting our women as well, you know? So we just have to get on with it as best we can. What in your mind can people like us or our listeners and viewers, what can they do to help? I still think it's really important that the awareness raising is going on. So I've been to a few Zoom meetings recently, obviously, mm -hmm. and everybody in this sector is still out there fighting to find victims, to house them, to raise awareness. None of this should stop just because of COVID. People like yourselves are carrying on with these conversations. I know all the people in policy are still fighting to get the government to be made more aware of what's happening. I know the government has put 1.73 million to the government system of care and housing. So there is that awareness raising going on, which is really important because people are still gonna be trafficked and exploited throughout this time. In fact, they're probably being treated worse because they're not making the money for the traffickers that they should. So don't think this crime has stopped because of COVID, because it's like a lot of other aspects of life, it's carrying on. And Jules and I always like to end our conversations on a, on a note of hope, um, so that people feel inspired um, 
yeah, could you could you tell us a bit about anything that's come out of this situation that's really hopeful? Oh yeah, let's try a few. So obviously the big thing is we now have three babies and although some of our babies are come from rape and exploitation, they bring new life and new hope, not only to the mums, but to everybody here around them, all the other women, all the staff. I mean, a baby is a great sign, isn't it? So we're really pleased about that. And our midwives and our health visitors have been amazing because one of our women has higher level mental health who gave birth. They've just been superb around her. They haven't stopped that good work. Believe it or not, we're connected to an orange farm in Valencia. And they've put all their oranges that are coming to London on divert to us. So we've had 29 boxes of oranges. So we have people here that can juice and juice and juice, make marmalade and orange sorbet. It's got to be a good thing. Yeah. We've had amazing volunteers sending us box of treats so that we know we're not forgotten and we know they're safe and well. So the volunteers still are trying to connect to us and the women. As I say, the immense work going on through Zoom meetings to up this awareness that's very important and I think for us we spent even more time with our women than usual so we can still see signs of recovery because we're joining in with them we're dancing we're laughing we're playing cards we have family time barbecues on a Sunday in the garden the garden ah, it's gone from celebrity jungle to Chelsea flower show I'm telling you it's absolutely brilliant out there. The women have done a fantastic job. I'm hoping that doesn't sound like exploitation, but they've been amazing in the garden. So we've got to, you know, we've got to show optimism and kindness. We've got to show them that we know we're going to get through this because they look to us. Everybody looks to us. And that's really important. And I think it's really important for me that I belong to Caritas Westminster, the team that run this house. And they're going out, they're feeding vulnerable people and families sending out packs to people that can no longer go to the lifelong learning center they're making the deaf aware of what's going on there's so much good coming out of this and i know that people see the downside but i think we should look to the good side and the nhs and everybody that's doing so much yeah wow yeah. karen i can i just say that's the brilliant because we ask everyone for a bit of hope and I, i've never seen someone reel off a list so i'm really really happy <laughs> Um, there's all hope there's got to be hope yeah well thank you so much for joining us today um thank you for for telling us all what you told us i think main takeaways are there's always got to be hope that's fantastic main takeaway also that you're pretty amazing and your team there are pretty incredible and also that these women and these survivors are getting real real care and and help and need from you so that's brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us, Karen. And um, thank you so much for what you two are doing as well. Just keep up the good work. Thank you, Karen. We'll thank see you, you soon. Bye.